for me, it was like, what is wrong with me? Why is God not letting me be a mom? Like, is it that he just wants to stop the yeah. genetics of me? Like, mm. you know, what what is it about me? The urologist looked at me and he said, your only options to become parents are IVF or adoption. Mm. And that was kind of a deflating, like, man, what do we do now moment. So I'm here with my good friends, Brad and Ronnie Robertson, and uh, we're going to have a pretty serious conversation today. I mean, for the most part, it's not something that we, you know, joke about a lot. But uh, one of the things, you know, on this podcast that I would love to talk to people about is just their faith journey, kind of how they have uh, arrived at where they have arrived, you know, whether that's um, theologically or just spiritually in general, kind of like how you view God, how you view the scriptures, and then also how you translate that into real life. Because a lot of times uh, what I have found and what a lot of people that I have talked to have found uh, in the world is that we read about certain things in the Bible. And in this instance, it's going to be something like uh, infertility, right? There's plenty of stories in the Bible of people who couldn't have kids and then ended up having kids when they were 90. That is not something that is realistic for most people, right? I'm not going to say that God can't do something, but that is just unheard of these days, right? So there's times where we read about stories in the Bible, we read about theological ideas in the Bible, and we have to reconcile those with real life and kind of how we're supposed to view God, how we're supposed to interpret the Bible and apply it to our lives. Um, So something, you know, I've talked to a lot of other people about uh, all kinds of different things, politics, you know, from everything from raising kids to, you know, church life, all kinds of things. So today we're going to be talking about um, your journey through uh, IVF, uh, through fertility, trying to have kids, basically. And um, I think it's something that I just don't really see talked about publicly, and I think that's because it's so personal and it's so private. I think there is probably a lot of shame that goes into it, and so, you know, we've talked about a lot of that stuff, and so I just want you guys to be able to elaborate on it, tell your story, because, uh, and one of the things, just so people know, uh, one of the reasons Brad and Ronnie started their own uh, ministry, which is your blog, uh, and before I forget, go ahead and shout that out. That's Party of Two Waiting.com, Party of the Number Two Waiting.com. Yeah, and so um, you had begun to write a lot about the journey that you guys had gone through with infertility and trying to have kids, and uh, it's pretty deep, you know, and I know a lot of that was to process kind of what you were going through, Um, but you didn't start there, obviously. Uh, I am curious, you know, and we talked kind of right before we pressed record, there has to be this moment where people decide, hey, we're going to, you know, we've tried having kids the natural way, Mm -hmm. and... Uh, we hadn't found many resources on how to help us, um, whether the natural way or, or moving forward, what steps you have to take after that, because so many people want kids. Um, Brad, you've said, you know, you feel like God has called you to have a child. And when God is not providing said child, it can just be really difficult to work through that and to wonder if he's, you know, for you, as I mentioned the other day online, if he's for you, uh, if, you know, you feel like there is uh, a calling on your life to raise kids, to be parents, then you're having to reevaluate what that looks like. So um, I'd love to know, you know, how long was it before you guys decided, how long had you been married um, until the point that you decided you wanted to start some other kind of, you know, I'll say, I don't know, unnatural, what would be the right word? Yeah. Supplemental um, treatment? Assisted. Yeah, assisted. More assisted. Yeah. Okay, yeah. yeah. Um, and again, forgive me if I say something that is offensive or politically incorrect or what, you know, it's just hard to navigate these conversations sure, with sure. people. Um, so yeah, from the time that you guys started, you know, g- you got married um, a little later than a lot of our friends, Brad, I know got yeah, married, I don't yeah. know about Ronnie's friends, but um, watching friends get married, happening that happening a little later for you. Um, from the time you started trying to have kids to deciding, hey, this probably isn't going to happen the way we want it to or as easily as we wanted it to, um, w- you know, you had to make take different steps. So about how long was that, kind of that journey? So we got married uh, March 2019 and then decided going into the first year of marriage um, or the first anniversary that we wanted to start Mm. trying. Mm. And we both have come from families that did not struggle to have kids. Uh, My mom has said, and jokingly, like I don't think she meant it like for me to take it to heart, but it was like a like sneeze with your legs closed because it's going to be really easy. Mm. Um, 
And so still like, don't, still don't like that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that still makes me uncomfortable. Yeah. Um, but I mean, so, so we started and COVID happened. And so like Facebook, everyone's getting pregnant. We thought it would happen quickly for us and it's not. Um, they say that you need to wait a year um, mm. because like to see a doctor, right? Yeah. Um, because is it one out of 12? One so out of it's 10? 10 to 12 percent chance every month that you're trying that you will actually get pregnant. Mm. So the, the math, right, is that after 12 months, you mm. should have hit that that once. money shot at least once. Right. Mm. And, and had that work. So. So uh, we uh, we. We fudged the numbers a little bit, and we went to the doctor about 10 months after. Mm. Um, because it's hard, right? Like, there's a constant heartbreak of each month taking that pregnancy test and, and seeing that it's not positive. Yeah. And the first couple months, it's like, okay, like, yeah, friends struggle. It takes a little while to get in a rhythm, whatever. But then you start to hit, um, you know, months five, six, mm seven then it starts to become desperation well and i feel like ours felt even worse because all we were doing was sitting at home Mm -hmm. with covid stuff like didn't have i couldn't go into the office for school couldn't like there was no actual distraction we were like very much in the everyone is getting seems to get pregnant right now and Mm -hmm. we are not yeah yeah and i think like you know it's it's different for everybody to your point you know, we got married, I was already 30 when we got married. And so I didn't really want to be like a really old dad. Mm. (laughs) I didn't want my kid to graduate high school when I was walking with a cane or a walker, which could happen sooner than later anyway. Um, And so we were kind of like probably a little more desperate than some of our friends that got married when they were 24 or 25, right? And didn't feel that same pressure. Um, so I think it's different for everybody. For us, it just very much felt like all of my friends had kids. Um, her friends were all getting married and starting to talk about kids. And so it was like, all right, it's a good time for us to start. Um, but it was probably around month seven when it didn't, like it hadn't worked that we decided it's time to contact a doctor. And of course, that's when we learned about the 12 month rule. Mm. Um, so we booked an appointment right then and there. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and that took us, so it ended up being just under a year before we saw a doctor. Yeah. Um, and so typically we're, we're looking up stats today. Um, it's one out of four women have an issue with fertility. Um, and it, it's most commonly on the woman's mm-hmm. side. Um, so one out of 10 marriages will struggle with infertility, but one out of four is the woman mm-hmm. who like struggles with that. Um, and so that's what they looked at me first. Um, and had me chart lots of things and like did a bunch of blood tests and scopes and and, yeah. yeah, And there's nothing, they couldn't find anything that was wrong. And so then, then Brad had to do tests. Which are really awkward. It's very uncomfortable as a man to like have to test for fertility, um, because of the way that they have to go about getting samples of, uh, semen and sperm and all of those things, it's, it's, it can be mortifying. And I think that's part of, you know, you mentioned shame at the start. I think that's why people don't want to talk about it, especially mm-hmm. men, mm-hmm. because it's awkward. Like it's, it's weird to have to talk to somebody about that. And I'll never forget, we got connected to, or I got connected to a guy that had gone through a similar issue. Um, and even the first lunch we had, like it was, <laughs> I didn't know what to say. Cause I'm like, I don't really want to talk about this, mm. but I need to talk about it. And so, um, we did all the testing and it, it came back that, uh, I was in fact the issue, um, at least initially. And, um, it wasn't that I had like, so one of the things that's really common, right. Is low T low testosterone. So I don't have low T, but my body is basically like converts every every man's body converts testosterone to estrogen at some rate um mine was doing it just a little bit faster mm. and so it wasn't allowing me to produce the right sperm count and thing and they they s- swim in the wrong direction and, and there was like all these different things um so we tried medications diet exercise stop drinking alcohol like 
there was this list of things, and I mean, I did every last thing I was told to do. Like, I lost 35 pounds mm. in three months. Jeez. I was running like crazy, like, really wasn't, you know, with the occasional, like, guy's night or whatever, wasn't drinking any alcohol. We were trying to eat better. Um, went back to the doctor and still hadn't worked, right? And so that's when it was – the I'll never forget. I was sitting in a doctor's office, and the, the doctor, the urologist, looked at me, and he said – your only options to become parents are IVF or adoption. Hmm. And that was kind of a deflating, like, man, what do we do now moment. Yeah. Um, so a little background on us. Uh, I We didn't really have this conversation before marriage, but I did not do well with blood or shots. Hmm. And so, like, we had joked. Uh, uh, <laughs> so this is early. Can I tell the story? Yeah, you can tell the story. So, like, early in marriage, we were going to be on the I'm not going to get, like, demonetized, am I? No, no. no, no. <laughs> All right. Uh, early in marriage, um, we Brad was putting me on his insurance plan. And Cummins has the Live Well Center. And so mm-hmm. um, you had to do a physical. And one of the things in the physical we didn't know or didn't realize um, was a finger prick. Okay. I knew. I realized it. <laughs> I did not know. <laughs> um, and so I go there. And I'm doing all the physical things. Uh, and then they go to prick my finger. And Brad gets done, and he's just, like, right across the hall. And I, like, mm. see him walking. And I'm like, hey, Brad, can you come in here and just, um. like, hold my hand? Because Ooh. I don't do well with blood. And and I laughed um, at the nurse. The nurse, well, so she sent a nurse that said, your, your wife needs you to hold her hand mm-hmm. while her finger gets pricked. And I said, ha, pansy. Because I was like... Who needs it's a finger prick? Like who needs your hand held during a finger prick? Apparently my wife does. This was a month into marriage. Yeah. Um He wants some really big points right now. They pricked her finger and her eyes rolled into the back of her head and she slumped in her chair and just was out cold. And I'm sitting there thinking, like, this lady just killed my wife. She's <laughs> and the dead. last the I'm last thing you said. To me, was you're a pansy. Yeah, I, know. <laughs> I I have a very similar experience with needles, and yeah, multiple times in the same visits to like well centers and things for physicals. I it wasn't a finger prick like that won't do it, but an actual blood draw, yeah. Yeah. probably five or six times in my life, and and like multiple times had happened in the same visit. Oh. That I don't know if it's just seeing the blood or I think it's the needle. I think it's just the the like mental needle yeah. thing going in that's just like you know again it's not a shot like i don't pass out from like a flu shot or something like that but i you know those bigger needles um put me down and that's like, a big reason why i don't let your wife give me shots when i have cavities yeah no i get it i get it <laughs> I but that, that was like that was an important lesson for yeah. us because little did we know at that time like we joke about it now right but yeah it was a huge problem then when we started talking about the difference between adoption and ivf because a huge part of IVF is shots and, and needles, needles blood yeah. and blood draw. Like it was, yeah. and so Ronnie was dead set against for the longest time. Like I will not do IVF. Um, yeah. so, when that becomes your only option to biologically have kids, that I mean changes yeah. things. So if we can um, just talk about, so what we'll just dive into what exactly have you gone through and yeah. kind of what's the timeline. So I know I have, I can't even tell you really, I can't exaggerate how many friends I have, like close friends who are having trouble having kids. Um, I don't have any conspiracy theories about why that might be. I mean, I remember somebody made a joke to us about um, the COVID shots um, that they said, well, good thing you uh, you got that. Good thing you are already having a second kid because now you won't have any more, you know, and it's just kind of like, well, since then we have had another one, you know, a third one. Um, but the amount of people close to me who are dealing with the same exact stuff, you know, whether it's low T or yeah, the guy says it's my fault, you know, my, you know, it's a problem with me, or the woman says it's a problem with me, you know, um, PCOS. We talked about that mm-hmm. as well, right? That that can be one mm-hmm. of the a, a big reason that people can't have kids. Um, what have you gone through? You know, from the time you started, you decided, okay, we're going to go the IVF route, um, and maybe before we get there. Uh, you had to weigh also financially, what is this going to mean? Yeah. So how did you make the decision 
to go IVF first and then are there other options for yes. biological kids? Mm. There there's sort one of. one other option. Well, I guess I guess there's a couple other options, but so the 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 options overall biologically are IUI, which the slang version of that is the turkey baster method, right? Mm. Like Yeah, yeah, yeah. They take um, your sperm and Yeah. Yeah. Then there's so there's IUI, there's IVF, mm-hmm. um, which is the petri dish version. Okay. So take his sperm and my egg and make an embryo. Make an okay. Embryo. You can also, um, I mean, if you you can adopt an embryo, uh, or if you make an embryo, you can use like a gestational carrier mm-hmm. or a surrogate. Um, and then, like I said, you can adopt an embryo. So that so there's a lot of different kind of things that all tie together um, in terms of the process, but. From a to answer your question from a financial standpoint, right? Um, the three options that were kind of on the table for us were IVF, adoption, and fostering. Hmm. And before we got married, we had talked about adoption, um, and that was something that was kind of on our hearts that we would want to do at some day, like yeah. at some point. So the three the three options you said that you had weighed out financially were basically IVF, IUI. Was that what it was called? The, yep. the turkey baster yep. method and yep. then the surrogate, a surrogate. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, so biologically, those are the three ways that you could do it. Yes. So then financially, what is the difference in those three things? And so, I'll even throw those up on the screen. So IUI is, IUI is the cheapest of the three of those. Okay. So because it's it's pretty non-invasive, invasive, but it wasn't really an option for us. You have to have so many... Like your sperm count has to be a certain number hmm. to to even be able to do IUI, but we okay. weren't there. Okay. Yeah. Um, so that IV, was next. Yep. Yeah. IVF do you is how probably much that cost? uh it's about ten or eight to fourteen thousand dollars, I think. Eight um, to fourteen. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's a pretty big gap. Like. Yeah, it all depends a, on medical jump. insurance okay. and like what kind of medicine, because there's different protocols that they follow and. Um, do insurance that was actually one of the questions that someone asked me um, I asked people to submit questions uh, a friend asked um, if insurance covered any type of stuff for IVF or IUI um, has that been an issue it's very dependent on, like, on your, your company yeah so Cummins where I work has a $15,000 lifetime benefit for mm. um, fertility treatments Okay. Family planning, right? Yes, so. family planning. So, it, it, and that can be used like for medication, procedures, adoption, you know, credits, whatever you need it for, it's there. But once it's gone, it's gone, mm-hmm. right? Um, and so that would have covered a single cycle probably of IUI. Okay. Um, it doesn't even touch a single cycle of IVF, which ranges in the twenty to $26,000 range. Mm. Per... Per egg cycle. retrieval. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so IVF, it's like um, they have to put me under, and this is after like a month of shots, right? Mm-hmm. A month of shots to like make my body overproduce eggs okay. um, or drop a bunch of eggs. Um, and so then mm-hmm. from there, like say I have 20 that drop, then they put his sperm and my 20 eggs in different petri dishes and then like from there it's like what makes embryos and so typically and then which embryos are actually viable yeah sure um so to start that it's so one cycle is the embryo like creation and then every transfer after okay so technically we've been through two cycles wow two full cycles yeah, yeah. Okay. So a cycle costs twenty to twenty six thousand. Every transfer, meaning one viable embryo going in, is five thousand or so. Mm, maybe. Yeah, I mean, between shots and and different things. Yeah. I mean, the whole cycle has like twenty six thousand dollars. It's spot on. Okay, so so you guys wanted to at least try the biological first. You had considered any of those options, and then you know, after that. So we'll, we'll get there because I think that's going to be a little bit of a different conversation, kind of where you guys are maybe now in, in your minds versus uh, where you were kind of then. I would love to know uh, and hit on, you know, there's probably people that wonder what all goes into IVF and maybe you had looked into it and maybe you'd be even been surprised at like, oh, I didn't know this was a thing or I didn't, you know, I read about this, you know, a little bit. You said you had a hard time finding resources. Well, um, but go ahead. 
I say we, we actually found a lot of resources for women because like I said, okay. like okay. there are a lot of women that have PCOS or endometriosis. Like hmm. there are a lot of things, um, like if, I guess women fertility is more commonly studied and more commonly talked about. Okay. Um, but the reason we started blog, the reason why we like um, struggled was cause mm-hmm. it wasn't, I mean, there's like, there's nothing. no resources for men that are mm. going through that. So had you started the blog? So you, I, you I came started. up with the idea for the blog and started writing privately, like in a Word document or a Google Doc. Okay. Um, but we weren't publishing anything at that time. Um, at the, you know, initially, we were kind of in different places in how we were processing this. Like, Ronnie didn't want to be the poster child for infertility. Mm-hmm. Um, I just wanted an outlet um, to, to, you know, put my thoughts and consolidate those and kind of process um and so, and we, you had done that before. Yeah, you, you blogged I, for yeah. several we years. We both have had know. a blog okay. before, and and so it wasn't a it wasn't like a oh this is a new thing I'm going to jump into. Sure. It was kind of like hey this is kind of how I process. Yes, yeah, it's how I've processed yeah. for years, and yeah. and uh, but I wanted to respect my wife and not yep. put our you know our yep. business out there if yep. she didn't want me to, and so we kind of hit pause on that idea, and then once we went through a couple of the first like failures. We were like, um, one of the motivations was really there were so many people that were asking and wanting to know what was going on and like Mm. looking for updates. It was like, man, it would just be easier if we started this blog so we didn't have to rehash this story every single time somebody asked. We could just say, hey, go check out, you know, go check out partyoftwowaiting.com. Yeah. So. Yeah. And I, I see a lot of that stuff and it is super vulnerable. And what, Brad, you just, I think, did you write the Father's Day one yeah, that, that you just posted? I mean, just, I think that, you know, the theme of, of the pain uh, of all of this, of not being able to have kids, um, of even trying the ways that, you know, okay, alternative methods, we're going to, we're going to go, you know, the more scientific route, um, you know, once that kind of starts to fall through too, you know, it can just be so painful. Um, I'm curious, you know, you said, Brad, that you had realized uh, eventually Hey, this is probably my fault. Mm-hmm. I say fault. I don't mean it. You know, this. No, this I mean is that's how I felt. Yeah, with your body. You know, this is kind of something that that you had to carry once you realize, like, hey, Ron, Ronnie's fine. The doctor said there's no reason she shouldn't be able to have kids. Um, and and you had said that that was just really, really tough to talk about. But the finding uh, some other dudes that had gone through it was really really helpful um, because you weren't alone. And again, I don't hear a lot of this conversation in the public space, but especially from the guys. And I think, uh, you know, you said it's particularly hard on women. Uh, I think in other cultures, you know, your value comes from child rearing, right? And that's kind of like, even for a long time, I would say in America, that still was sort of, you know, a more conservative mindset of like, that's the reason that women sort of existed was like, you take care of the home, which includes taking care of the kids. Uh, And if you're not going to do that, then what are you going to, what value are you going to bring now? Obviously our world, you know, our society is moving a little more towards like, no, you can, you can do anything. It doesn't, you know, not having kids doesn't make you lesser. Right. And I don't think it does. Obviously Um, you guys don't think it does, but you can certainly start to feel that way. Um, How has it been watching all of your friends kind of have kids? You know, we, it's, and I bring that up because Brad, in your Father's Day post, you had mentioned, uh, and every Father's Day, I think about this. Every Mother's Day, we've kind of talked about this off camera too. It can be really painful to see other people celebrating. You had mentioned in COVID, other people were having kids. It's really hard. Um, but I would love for us to sort of develop an empathy towards, like, hey, every celebration also seems to come with, you know, there are people that are dealing with things that are really heavy and really hard to deal with, and how to uh, kind of walk with those people. Um, would you say there is anything that's been a comfort to you guys uh, when you see other people celebrating the things that, that you want, like kids, you know, just, just Father's Day, for example. I mean, you know, Brad, your dad is great, but you want to be a dad. Yeah. It's a big deal, right? Yeah, I think um, for me, you know, one of the things I get uh, that helps me through that is just that I'm so excited that people don't have to struggle with what we struggle with, mm-hmm. right? Like as much as I want to find community and like Mm -hmm. connect with people that are having the same problems and and on the same journey as us, I don't want that for anybody either. Um, one of my really close friends that that lives out of state, 
like him, him and his wife are trying and they're starting to get nervous because they've been a couple months and they're not really sure. And so he and I have had some conversations about what steps do they need to take and how do they, you know, reach out to a doctor and what does that look like? And I'm so I'm thankful that we've publicized our story for yeah. that reason. Um, but you know, it's, it's this, uh, it's this delicate balance between like my, I can celebrate you and as a dad mm -hmm. and still grieve for myself as not a dad. Right. Yeah. And, and I think, you know, you put it in a really good perspective too, of like having empathy for people around holidays, because that could be the case with anything, anything, you know, like yeah. my family lost our house to a fire a few days before Christmas when I was in high school. So there was a really long time where Christmas didn't feel celebratory. Yeah. Right. It was a horrible reminder. Mm -hmm. Um, there are, you know, people who's, and this is what my post was about. There's people whose fathers have passed away mm -hmm. and they, you know, you understand that. Yeah. And, and there's people whose dads were never in their life mm -hmm. or were abusive or, you know, were in and out of their lives because they were addicted to something, right? Like there's all these different, um, life experiences. And I think it's good that people are starting to be more cognizant and aware of what other people's life experiences are like. Um, our church did a really great job at Mother's Day of putting together a video where they spoke specifically to the women that can't become moms or yeah. want to become moms and haven't. Um, you know, I, I don't Father's Day wasn't as well. We didn't go to church on Father's Day. That's right, because you had strep. So I don't know how they handled it on Father's Day. Um, that might have been a blessing in disguise, actually, that mm -hmm. we weren't there. Um, but yeah, it's it's a it's a delicate balance in figuring out how do I grieve for myself in my own time, but also celebrate the people around me. So for me, like Sunday last week, it was like, all right, I'm gonna put all my focus on my dad and Ronnie's dad and my grandpa, and we're going to celebrate them while they're here, and that's going to be the focus. Yeah. And then I'll figure out how to grieve when everybody goes home. <laughs> mm. You know, like sometimes you just have to, I don't know what the right term is, but put on your put big on boy pants, right, yep. and yep. and suck it up. And, and because you want to celebrate those people and you care yep. for them, um, and it's okay to then be sad afterwards. Like that's not a problem. And I've heard people say, you know, not just sad, but like, it's okay to be really upset too. Yeah. It's okay to be mad, you know, and, um, I had mentioned this on Facebook. There's this whole idea of, you know, if you say I want to have kids, but God kind of won't allow you to have kids seemingly, um, why not? Mm -hmm. you, you have to ask that question. And I think we all wrestle through the question, you know, why, why me? Like, why, why, why did they get to have kids? And not just like one kid. Why do they get to have multiple kids? Like, and we and we don't even have one. Like one would do. Well, and and, and we, we we joked too. Not joked. We we talked too about you know. There's even a difference between people who have one kid and can't have any more. Mm -hmm. That's completely different than like it's it's a similar struggle, but it's different. It's like you yeah. have a child, you know, and and to not have any. I mean, that feels it feels different. I think that was a big part of our struggle with fostering at first mm -hmm. too, because um, we had talked about wanting to adopt we talked about one like maybe wanting to foster mm. um I, we were really hesitant on fostering because it, at that at, at the point where we were at it was like we can't even have a single kid but here are all these parents that that can have that can yeah. and have made messes of situations yeah. so like yeah. how are we supposed to just give this kid back sure you know yeah, the bitterness that would come right yeah. in the beginning with if we had pursued that option right away, we were worried, one, about heartache. Mm -hmm. Like you get connected to those children and then the idea is that they're reunified and, and go back to their families. And that's a beautiful thing, especially if it works. Yeah. Um, but also like the bitterness of, um, you know, what do you mean this this person has made the same mistake over and over and over again with yeah. drugs or alcohol or crime, whatever it is, but continues to have kids over and over and over again. Yeah. And we're over here like trying to do everything we can and it's not working, mm -hmm. right? There's a, that, that creates a bitterness and, a, and almost like a hardened heart that we really didn't think we could handle at the time. Yeah. yeah. No, that is so heavy. And I, I don't think... To your point, we don't we don't think enough about the people who are mourning a lot of times. 
because I think it's sort of like you don't know how to do both. You don't know how to celebrate, and and frankly, it's really hard. It's really hard to celebrate something while also kind of feeling this. It's almost like you're so I'm supposed to be leveled out, you know, like and just not like not have the highs or the lows Mm -hmm. because you know because it's like well you want to celebrate but you also want to mourn with people um what do you think i want to get into your specifics of ivf and kind of exactly what you've gone through ronnie um your body just mentally physically um emotionally everything like that um but i also you know would really love to know um how this has sort of affected your spiritual life Mm -hmm. And because I don't I don't want to forget about that, um, that part of the journey, because, you know, that's what a lot of these episodes are about, you know, on the podcast. How do you think you guys have dealt with it? Obviously, emotionally, it's been really hard. You know, um, we'd mentioned before you you guys were supposed to come up for dinner one night and it it wasn't able to happen because um, it had just you had just found out that you weren't going to have a kid, you know, um, and that's really painful. Uh, Obviously, we're fine with that and we understood. But, you know, it kind of can mess with your whole entire life and and your whole demeanor your mental physical spiritual health so spiritually how do you think this has affected you guys what do you think you've learned um through the journey because you know you still haven't gotten a positive pregnancy test you know you're still you're still on the journey and my prayer is that someday you get to come back on and we get to celebrate that you know something that you've desired has worked and uh, we can thank god for it um, but spiritually, on the journey, how do you think the journey of infertility and IVF and then potentially uh, looking into fostering, how has that shaped your spiritual lives? Well, I'm, like you said at the beginning, there are a lot of stories in the Bible of couples being infertile mm. and then being blessed with a baby <sighs> later in life. Um, there are also stories in the Bible where God's curse or punishment has been you can't conceive. Yeah. Um, and mm. there are lots of verses in the Bible where it's like, blessed are those who can carry children. Also in James, like, care for the orphans and the widows. Mm. Um, and all of that, it, it's, it's, it feels mm. like a very similar, I have to hold a celebration and a grief. Yeah. Um, mm. Like, rejoice in trials and, and like, Consider it joy when you face persecution and go through struggles. Well, right now, I, I want to use joy to describe our situation in a yeah. lot of ways. Um, so I think um, for me, it was like, what is wrong with me? Why is God not letting me be a mom? Like, is it that he just wants to stop the yeah. genetics of me? Like, mm-hmm. you know, what what is it about me? Um and that, I mean, originally that was my, my really big struggle. Um, and I think now it, it's more been like, uh, kind of the changing of, of, uh, perspective, like why not me? Um, yeah. because like, why I've got a really great teammate in Brad and, um, I mean, we both have a heart for kids. And so, um, between student ministry and teaching and other, th- other places in our lives, like we just really mm-hmm. care about kids. And so, uh, why not us for things like fostering adoption where kids might not get that love and support? Um, yeah. do you, but do you that's ever, hard. <laughs> do you ever feel like you've gotten an answer from God on why? I mean, I it's not often that I hear God or ever uh, audibly speak to me. I mean, sometimes you'll be reading the scriptures and have some kind of revelation sort of or be praying, and, and maybe it dawns on you, you know, you get a piece about a certain idea mm-hmm. that God has for your life. Um that's the only way it's ever really happened for me when God is answering any questions or you feel a nudge in a certain direction or other. It's just peace about the direction that I'm headed or the decision I'm going to make, um, over a different type of decision. Right. So for you, IVF versus fostering versus, you know, any, any other options, you know, um, you've had to have probably gotten peace along the way, some kind of peace in the midst of the storm. For me, uh, Brad gets on me all the time, but like, I like, I like answers. She's like I, black and white I, as, as much as it comes. <laughs> mm. So like I, I, there's more peace and, and maybe just a calmness in having an answer than not having an answer. And so like, if you're just to tell me right now, like, you know, like this table is brown. Okay, great. I, if I had a question about this table being ground, brown, I can now go to sleep. Like knowing okay. this table is brown. Right. And like, I, I mean, like, even if this table is really blue, I mm. wouldn't even question it. Like, I just have an answer. Uh, Maybe and so we can like, start the whole uh, 
was the black or blue dress. Oh, yeah, yeah. There you go. Yeah. Um, we have – oh, my, I don't even wear that shirt anymore. Uh, <laughs> my shirt that's gray and blue. Anyway, um, I – with this, I really want – I mean, like, I just – prayed a lot that God would just give me an answer. Like, mm-hmm. if you're going to tell me no, like, I can't tell me no. Me save yeah. me the time, save me the energy, save me the yeah. effort. Um, and so sometimes there have been moments where it's like, should we continue? Should we change paths? Should we do whatever? And it's just like, as soon as I have an answer, I'm like, great, that's the answer. Because then or a I can, semblance of an answer, yeah. right? Like, that's I think that's part of the hard part is when you get into that mentality in your spiritual life, for both of us, this isn't just Ronnie, like, we were so desperate for answers yeah. Yeah. that we were like looking everywhere for an answer, mm-hmm. right? And so like it could be stupid stuff like there was a, a baby formula sample that showed up at our house in the mail, mm-hmm. and I'm like, that's the answer. Like we're supposed to keep down this path because God sent us a baby formula sample in the mail. Like, I, and I know I know it sounds like you're joking, but you're not joking. No, I'm 100 like percent serious. Yeah, like that's and, really I, where my I, brain. I've went. experienced similar things to that. Where yeah. you, you were just so desperate for an answer, you will interpret anything yeah. as that. I mean, it'd be one of those things that you need an answer to something, and you're just like, okay, God, show me the answer, and you take your Bible, and I throw it open on the yep. table and say, go, God, you know, and oh, you know, yeah. oh, that's a sign, yep. you know, I landed on this verse, you know, and that, you know. Or you try to pin, like, absolutes on God. And so, like, we, at some point in this journey, we really decided, like, Ronnie, you know, kept saying, like, thy will be done. Like, I want to lean into that, right? And we were getting ready to go through a transfer, and we prayed that prayer, and Ronnie spoke about it at youth group. Mm. And then when God said no, (laughs) and we didn't, we were like... But thy will be done. How could you give us a no, right? Like <laughs> that that yeah. can't be that can't be right. That and can't be my will. <laughs> that can't be his will, right? And so like you just start to rationalize yeah. everything or like yeah. look for crazy answers and and sometimes, you know, we don't get the answer. And I think for my spiritual life, like I went through a, a, a period of like grief and then I was angry and then I was kind of like um, ambivalent to like God. Like I didn't I didn't care going to church didn't excite me. Like I was just kind of going to church actually made me sad. Mm. Um, but I feel like I've hit kind of, and Ronnie can tell me if, if she agrees or disagrees, but (laughs) I, in this last, I don't know, probably six to eight months, not that I haven't still been really sad at times, but I do feel like I have recognized an opportunity to, I don't feel like prior to IVF, I was a great spiritual leader as a husband. Mm. Um, I just didn't really know what that looked like. Ronnie has like Bible college training. Like she knows the Bible 10 times better than I do, um, which is awesome. Like I love that because I can ask her questions and she can answer them and I don't feel like an idiot. Um, but Nerd. I found <laughs> I found myself in this place where I was struggling because I'm like, man, I can't give my wife children Mm. and I'm not leading very well Mm. spiritually, like start to question my masculinity and my manhood. And in the last just, I don't know, handful of months, maybe this year, like I feel like God has really shown me how do I lead us spiritually? And and that's going through devotions, but also having hard conversations and Mm challenging Ronnie to think about things differently when she's desperate for an answer, right? And wants to see it black and white, how do I help her see the gray? Yeah. Um, and so that's, that's been kind of a cool thing that I feel like God has done for me in the last, uh, like I said, six months or so. We've been married f- over four years and I finally feel like I am able to lead us spiritually in a way that is productive and like biblical. Yeah. Ronnie, do you, I'm going to put you on the spot. Is that something you see too in yes. Brad? You feel like you've seen yeah. Brad grow? In yeah. That? I, I've, we've had several conversations uh, this week, actually. Mm. It's just been like thanking him for taking such an initiative um, to yeah. really just push our, our faith deeper and to make steps forward, like to continue to grow and to like continue to see our, our future, not just in terms of we're blessed because we have children or we don't have children. Yeah. Um, but like we're blessed because we have each other and we have a great house and we have family that is still alive and um, like financially we're okay. And like we have many other blessings that that it's not, it shouldn't be 
in black and white of in terms of success. Well, that's such that's such a good perspective. Like, I mean, for everything you don't have that you want, there are things you do have that other people don't. Yeah. And yeah, I mean, I know that doesn't make that specific issue of kids easier, um, but I think gratitude is huge. Yeah. You know, in in your Christian life. So, Ronnie, for you, how do you think it's affected you spiritually? probably in a little bit different way than Brad. Um, so if Brad is, you know, hey, I've seen these changes in Brad, Brad's saying I've seen these changes in myself, you know, leading my family spiritually, is there anything in, in your life that you feel like you've kind of come around to uh, from a spiritual standpoint? I think... Has, has, it, has it deepened your, your faith in God, your desire to know Him, anything like that? I think... More than anything, it's made me realize how little control I have. Like, mm. I really like control. Mm. Um, I like to feel like I can understand things and, like, put it together. And, um, you know, there there's controversy on whether or not you should do IVF if IVF is playing God, and we've, like, had to have okay. those conversations yeah. kind of battle through that. Um, and we have our thoughts. Obviously, we did IVF. Um, but even in that, even in a should-work like God can still, like God yeah. still has the power to say yes and no. Like there's yeah. no going around God, um, yeah. and and that's okay mm. because there have been plenty of times in our in both of our lives where we have begged God for something, um, and it hasn't happened, and it's end up being the best thing for us. Yeah, yeah. I feel like it could could really go sort of either way. You know, I mean, this could either really really strengthen somebody's faith, or it could really have the opposite effect to where it's like you're just in such a dark hole. It's like, you know, God, screw you. Like, you know, frankly, yeah. like that. I'm. This isn't worth it. Like, you you are not working for me. You know, there nothing about this seems kind. Why would I want to follow a God who's unkind? Yeah. You know. And, and I think I think a lot of times people deal with it more so in losing kids, um, but like even in the not having kids, you know, it's, it's a different kind of pain, um, but still a pain that I think can push you either closer to the Lord or farther away from him. Uh, if you let it, you know, even what Job's wife in the Bible says, like tells her husband, go curse God and die, you know, like, so I think a lot of people end up there. What do you think's kept you from not? Well, I think there's two things, right? I think there's, there's, it can pull you away from God or bring you closer, but also in a marriage perspective, right? Mm -hmm. Like it can wreck marriages and, we, we know some people yeah. that have, you know, they're, yeah. they're battling through divorce and other things because of infertility struggles. Mm. Um, and so if, you know, on, on one hand, we find ourselves very thankful to God that, like, we are in the minority maybe of couples that go through this and we don't face marital issues. Mm. Um, I definitely think it's brought us closer together as a, as a married couple, um, we definitely enjoy each other, uh, even one-on-one and, and we've been able to get to a point where we're like, Hey, if this is it, right? Like if it's just us against the world, like we can do that. That's okay. Right. Um, and some people don't want to go down that path, yeah. uh, for, for spiritual, how did it, how did we work against that? I think it was really just being open and honest with other people, and ourselves about where we were struggling. Mm. And there for a while, there wasn't like a healing prayer Sunday at church where we didn't go forward. Yeah. Um, and, and a lot of times like wouldn't even talk. Mm-hmm. I remember we, I walked up one Sunday, tears falling down my face. And Joe Meek was like, you don't have to say anything. We know exactly what to pray for because everybody knew what we were going through. Yeah. And so I think it's just that transparency with the people that pray for you. Yeah. Right. You don't have to be, doesn't mean everybody needs to start a blog, right? Like, Mm -hmm. or post, you know, do podcasts or post everything on, on Facebook. People shouldn't do podcasts. Um, Well, just you. Yeah. Just Just me. (laughs) Uh, But I do think it's important to have vulnerability and transparency, right? One of the things Scott Hunley says all the time is transparency breeds transparency. That certainly important. does. I mean, yeah. well, you talk about not getting together with a dude and not wanting to really not knowing how to start the conversation of like, hey, I'm struggling with this. You struggled with this. But like, how do we break open the, the conversation yep. about it? It's just still super awkward. Maybe it not is. as much for women. I don't Maybe it is. I don't know. But for guys, yeah, that's that's really weird. I mean, what it, what is he supposed to say to you? Right. What, what am I supposed to get out of this conversation? You know, ha- talking about this struggle. And sometimes it's just it helps to have people that are struggling with you. 
So I'm really, I'm really glad to, to know that you guys have kind of grown closer. Because the other thing too is, uh, regardless of kids, if you guys ever have kids, I mean, you could be married for another 50 years. Like, yeah. that's a lo- that's a long time, you know. Yeah. And even with kids, you know, uh, I'm very aware that you know I need notes from you because I feel like I've just lacked spiritual leadership in my marriage for a very long time. Um, I hope Bria wouldn't say that, but I don't know. I mean, maybe she would. And we all have room to grow. And again, it's a long journey. If you're going to be married sure. a lifetime, uh, statistically, you will actually be married longer without your kids <laughs> than you will with, with having kids. Yes. Yeah. That makes and sense. so the work that you're doing now is just, you, I don't know if you've thought about it like that, but it is just so important because you, if you don't have kids, you still have each other. You will still need to cultivate that. Yeah. that Man, marriage. I feel like you just blew my mind a little bit with that because I don't know that I've ever thought about it from that perspective. Mm-hmm. And it's like we've we've prayed so hard for kids. Not that we haven't. I mean, we've prayed for our marriage as well. But we've wanted kids so badly. And it's like when you step back and think about it, right, our life together is going to consist of the two of us, whether we could have natural children or not. Yeah more than it will us and kids like that's that's kind of a mind-blowing thought that i've never had before until this moment well we've talked about well so i come from a family divorce and um so we've talked about like putting this Mm. before kids Mm. um because that can be it i mean just like infertility can drive people to to break away from each other like so can having kids yes um yes (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, God, spouse, kids, like that's that's kind of the order of yeah. that we, from the get-go, from the time we got married, that's what we've talked about. Yeah. It's like that's where we need to put our focus. Well, I mean, it, you're blessed to be able to, just like any newly married couple, I mean, you know, four years in, you guys are. I mean, you're relatively <laughs> newly married. I mean, if you were any in any random church, you know, you could still be part of a married. new married class or whatever kind yeah. of. But it's one of those things that... High five four. Oh, my gosh. Stop. What? Isn't this so cool? Look, we're almost at the place in our marriage where we can high-five our marriage. Like, because we're the high uh, four. She's but, such a dork. High five. You're a nerd for sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's but so I cool. love it. The, but, you know, it really is one of those things that, like, kids, kids will change. What you want now could certainly change your marriage when you mm-hmm. get it. Yeah. yeah. Because you, you literally, and I mean, like, metaphorically you you kind of take your eyes off of each other but like physically you literally are just not looking at each other nearly as often as you used to like there are these you know one or two or three or how many ever kids people have i mean they are taking away your focus Mm -hmm. from each other so you know um there's i know it's a painful season but there's still a lot of this season that you uh can enjoy each other in a way that you won't ever be able to later um so i mean there's a plus side to that you know obviously I, i know that you know, people say the clock's ticking, that kind of thing. Obviously, as <laughs> I hate, I hate that phrase, but like that's kind of the notion, right? Is like people yeah. think like, well, you, you know, I'm running out of time. Like I've heard a lot of people say that. Yeah. And uh, Mother's Day, I got a couple comments where it was like, uh, you know, like, do you guys have kids yet? Mm. Like, how long have you been married? Well, you better start. I'm mm. like, well, you know what? I have been starting. Like, goodness gracious. <laughs> yeah, about to say some words in church. Yeah. That, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> you, you can kick I me can. out for it. <laughs> yeah. So, so while we're on that, I would li- really love to know um, what is it that you think people say that they don't mean to say that's really um, that can be hurtful or painful. I know people try to comfort you in all kinds of different ways. They say all kinds of different things with great intentions. Yeah. I don't think their intentions are ever to get rid of you or dismiss you or to disregard your pain or what you're going through, you know, the struggle. But are there thing, are there common things that people say that you're just like, man, I just really wish I never heard anybody say this ever again? Uh, Well, I mean, I think in general, people don't know how to have this conversation. Mm -hmm. Um, And so... Which is part of why we started the blog, right? Is to educate people, like, how do you interact with friends or family that are going through these issues and like you said like no one starts with an intention to hurt you but people are also very uncomfortable with other people's pain and so like i want to fix it yeah so generally any any comment that starts with a just it's like well just Mm. do this Mm. have you prayed about Mm. this like no what Mm. just trust god yeah Mm. like that's it 
That's all I have to do. That's what we've been doing wrong this whole time. <laughs> yeah, shoot. If only somebody had told us that a couple years ago. Yeah. Yeah. You mean yeah. I should have been praying about having kids? Right, I can't right, imagine. Right. right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, Give it to God. Um, God's got Just a stop trying, right? Mm-hmm. Like, it'll when happen you when trying, you stop it'll... trying. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Like we've been trying long enough that we've also had times of not trying. Yeah. And Yeah. yeah. And I mean, there's, you know, there's, uh, have you thought about this? Have you thought about that? It's, uh, honestly, you're, if, if I'm in a season of infertility, you're not going to think of anything I haven't thought of, right? Like everything from what position we should be in to African Yohimbi roots to like all of the different supplements that exist in the world, right? Like you can buy crap on Amazon for days that they, you know, says that they'll increase your sperm count or whatever. Right. We've looked at all those things. Have you thought about adoption? Have you thought about fostering? What? Yeah. What is that? Wow. Really? (laughs) Yeah. So, and sometimes people are probably just trying to make conversation. They are. And it's an awkward topic. They don't know how to say, they don't don't know what to ask or what's okay or, you know, they, I don't know. Yeah. And I mean, there's times where stuff comes out, right? Like you say something that you mean in jest and it, it's painful for somebody else to hear, mm-hmm. right? Things like, oh, you count yourself lucky you don't have kids, mm-hmm. right? Like they may not even know the situation or they know the situation and in the moment they're not cognizant of what's being said. And, and that's happened to us. Yeah. And multiple times. And, mm-hmm. and a lot of those people, like they're, well, I'd say probably 50 50 of those people reach out immediately and go, Oh my gosh, I'm so Didn't sorry. What I said. Yeah. Or, so, or a friend said, Hey, you're an idiot. Why did you say that? Yeah. And then they call us and they're like, we're really sorry. We didn't mean to upset yeah. you. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, the other 50% like just go about their business cause they don't even realize yes. because it, I mean, it's no different than if I was like, you know, uh, having a bad day at work and I'm like, ah, oh, just kill me now. Like, mm, and yeah. meanwhile, somebody's dealing with a dead sister or, or parent or, you know, like Shoot. you, you just yeah, say that real. and you don't think yeah. about the impact it has. So again, that kind of goes back to the being empathetic of yeah. other people's stories and their seasons. And, yeah. yeah. Um, I'd say the other things that people say that probably um, are not super helpful or, um, you know, well, maybe this is just what, like, this is God's plan. Just follow God's plan. And it's, it's like, I get that, right? It is God's plan, I'm sure, or a portion of his plan. Yeah. But in the moment, like, that's not comforting. Yeah. At least not for me. No. Um, oh, I had a thought. Shoot. Lost it. Lost it. It's gone. It was some, something else that people say. Yep. Um... Oh, just, I think the the hard part is I feel like you get uh, a black and white uh, kind of situation with this. Either people really want to make you feel included in some of their experiences, so they'll share like, oh, my pregnancy is really hard, and, and tell you all the ways they're struggling with that, or like how yeah. easy it was, or how hard, like, they'll, they'll want to keep you in the loop because yeah. they don't want you to feel left out, but then there are people who totally shut you out because mm. um, they don't want to be insensitive and so it's one of those like yeah maybe have a little bit more discretion when you're sharing about all the things about being pregnant because i love to be pregnant uh but and you'll celebrate it yeah when you are i mean you'll shout it from the rooftops probably like anybody else Mm -hmm. and yeah yeah and that's that's the other thing is we've had to kind of remind ourselves regularly like those people again are not trying to be insensitive right um you know, any, like when we've been around our friends that are pregnant and they complain about how hot it is in the summer to be pregnant or how much their back hurts or their feet hurt or how they can't get comfortable at night. Like they don't mean that to be painful, right? For us, they're just trying to share their life with us and that's important. And so like on the, uh, on the flip side, like one, having discretion as somebody that is pregnant and you're around somebody that can't get pregnant is great. On the other side, as people that can't have kids, like we also need to show grace to people that they mm-hmm. shouldn't have to like censor their lives mm-hmm. for us, right? Like we all live in community. Let's just make sure we're aware of everybody's feelings and mm-hmm. navigate life together and show grace when people mess up, even when we yeah. mess up, right? There's times we've made, we've handled situations with friends or family in ways that we probably could have done better. Yeah. 
Absolutely. out of our pain. And, yeah. and, you know, like we need to own that and apologize for that. And we hope that those people will show us grace and also yeah. apologize for where maybe they messed up. Right. Like, I mean, it's a two way cynicism street. can happen so easily yeah. through so many avenues, but certainly this one, I mean, it, well, being cynical about, you know, any kind of child rearing type of stuff or yeah. any, any kind of comment somebody makes that it's like, yeah, their season is bringing a different frustration than the frustration you have and, and, and they want yeah. to share their life and they're, yeah. you know, yeah, it is hard to walk on eggshells around that, those kinds of conversations. So, so good things to say or do. Yeah. I was going to say, how do you walk? You know, if somebody's dealing with infertility, if they're on some kind of adoption or IVF journey or fostering or in, anything where, you know, they're working towards a goal, how do people walk alongside you? So I helpful? think, I think Brad has had a lot of good people like mm. reach out to him mm. um, and just be like, if you need to scream, cry, like yeah. break things, well, shoot things, like yeah. if you, you know, like guy stuff, right? Like mm. you want to go think, blow something up, like let's go find a field to blow something up, you know, like within yeah. reason. Well, but let the record show, I would actually like to blow things up too. So, <laughs> but I mean, it's <laughs> we won't get into all that. Um, <laughs> we also might get Chris kicked off of YouTube here. Yeah, I was gonna say I, I don't, I'm not with them. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, like. Do you want to, do you need to, you know, go into the woods like and, yeah. and spend time Just, away? I have been very fortunate in having um, my guys just like reach out and say, what do you need? Hmm. Tell me what it is you need. And that's hard, right? Because especially for men, like we don't want to talk about it. Yeah. And so instead of saying, well, how are you doing or how are you feeling? They're like, what do you need me to do? Do you need to go play golf? Like, hmm. do you need to go drink a beer? What is it you need to do that will take your mind off this to help you process? So that has been incredibly helpful for yeah. me. Well, you you had even mentioned too, though. Sometimes you don't know. You don't and know you the don't. Answer. It's right? just like yeah. I, I, there's not really anything to do. And right? sometimes I mean, there's the not. The but yeah. there are other ways. Like even if you don't know, there's like especially like right after we've had failed transfers, people have shown up with things that we have to have, like meals. Mm-hmm. Um, Toilet paper. You know, well, you know, it's, it's crazy when someone dies in your family, Mm. um, there is a, people bring food and people kind of like come around you and there's some actual thing that happens like a funeral and with embryos, like we believe that embryos or that life starts at conception. So technically like we had life, um, and, uh, and so when that wife doesn't become a human being yeah. um, with us, there's like a whole new grief. Mm-hmm. Like, you, like you don't know how to process it. It's not like we can have an embryo funeral. It's not yeah. like we have all these memories stocked up, um, but all these hopes and dreams, like another death. Um, yeah. And so bringing, I mean, doing something like bringing food over, yeah. or like taking something off the plate, of somebody going through that. Um, yeah, I mean, we've had really people good. mow our yard. Like, we had <laughs> this, to this day, this will, I think it'll forever make me laugh. But one of our really good friends, like, she wanted to drop off cookies, but she didn't want to bother us or make us feel like we had to talk about it. So she literally snuck up our driveway, hid the cookies, like, by the back door, and then ran down. The, we didn't even know she came to the house until she texted us, like, a few hours later. Mm-hmm. was like, hey, there's cookies at your back door, right? So, like finding ways to love people where they are, but not make them feel like they have to rehash or talk about it can be incredibly helpful. I will also say though, that doesn't mean, and I think this was something that Ronnie really appreciated from her friends was like the, Hey, how are you doing with this? Like, how are you feeling? How do you feel about God? How do you feel about Brad? How do you feel about life? Right? Like, Asking somebody how they're doing and, and, and attentively listening, yeah, like truly, truly caring about what yeah. they have to say is, is so a really you, big deal. So you do appreciate when people ask. Yes. Because yeah. I, mean, I could see it being sort of the other way. Like, I just really don't want to talk about this. Well, it, I guess it depends on personality. I mean, right? you can yeah. ask. Or, if or the day, maybe. Yeah. Hey, yeah. this is not a day I want to talk about this. Yeah. yeah like. Some now, days are worse than others. Some weeks or months are probably worse than others. And I've had that conversation, right? Like somebody I've played golf with and I've been like, hey, today we are not talking about IVF. Mm. I don't want to go there, yeah. right? And they're like, okay, let's just talk about golf. Like, mm. okay, perfect. But it's also like there is a good balance of 
of question, uh, like, are you ready to hear the answer? Like, you know, we often pass each other and are like, hey, how's it going? Great, see you later. Mm-hmm. If I'm like, no, today really sucked with IVF, but you're already walking away. Like, yeah. that doesn't set the stage Set, well. set space, right, um, yeah. Okay. So setting space is great. Um, and also come in with a general knowledge of what someone is having to go through. Um, it takes a lot of emotional energy to even talk about yeah. the process. Um, but if I have to explain to you what it is and the emotional process, yeah. um, I mean, I mean, within our own story, like it's been going on long enough that people can go look up what IVF is and sure. like go do research. Yeah. And, yeah. and we've posted a lot of things about yeah. what IVF is. And so like for people that come to us trying to comfort us, but are like, what is IVF? Like, okay, seriously. Like, mm. Yeah, it's tough. Um, so on that note, yeah. um, for, for the people who, uh, aren't going to Google what IVF is, uh, I don't want to forget about asking you, um, and I might even just kind of clip this and throw it in toward the beginning of the, sure. um, of your journey in, in this episode. But, um, for those who kind of don't know what's involved with IVF, mm-hmm. you have have, you know, your body kind of goes through hell. You go through a lot. You had mentioned earlier, kind of the needles, and your fear of needles. Yep. Um, so when you found out you were going to, you, you know, you made the decision to do IVF, uh, Ronnie, what did that mean for you physically? Like what all, what, what all the treatments look like? Everything from, you know, shots to medicines to diet, you know, yep. anything like that. Well, so the first thing that you have to do is the egg retrieval. Um, and so you have to like trick your body essentially into dropping you know, like naturally, yeah. yeah, every single month a woman produces one egg, which is why, I mean, you have the lining that it's mm. supposed to stick to when the sperm comes in. And like that's, it's, I mean, like it, your body is set up to drop one egg. Um, and I think um, look, my cousin said we have like millions. Is that right? I have no idea. I don't know. You, if you guys don't know, nobody Yeah. I uh, say so we have like genetically we have lots and lots of eggs. Well, our body drops one a okay. month. Um, and so the embryo or the egg retrieval is the getting your body to drop as many as it can. Okay. Um, and so... I kept calling Ronnie the Easter Bunny during those... Uh... I, yes. Um, you should get one good joke out of it. There we go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so Brad actually... so. This was the stomach shots, right? Yeah. So it was, um, so you have, there's very time sensitive shots in order. I mean, obviously like women's bodies dropping an egg or producing an egg is like time sensitive anyway, right? Mm -hmm. Like that's why they have monthly cycles. Mm -hmm. Um, So this was very time sensitive to make sure that we hit the cycle at the right time. So that instead of one egg, she would produce 14, right? Or, Or whatever the case was. And so... Um, a lot of shots. I think the first probably egg retrieval period, there is um, at least one shot in the morning and the evening for 10 or 15 days. And then there's a couple other time sensitive shots. So like before you even enter into an actual procedure, we've probably stuck her with anywhere from 30 to 50 needles um, over the course of 20 days. Mm. So it's a lot. Right, mm-hmm. like it's it's pretty intensive, yeah. um, and especially at the beginning, like Brad was waking me up early so that I would, like, could eat something, so I'd have less chance of passing out, and then so I could lay in bed for a while if things weren't going well, so I could still make it to school yeah. and be conscious. <laughs> and there were times like she was doing bus duty at school, and there were times like she had to text her vice principal and be like, Hey, uh, like I'm not reacting well to the shot this morning. Like I'm going to be late. Right. Um, so it was, I mean, it was pretty stressful like that. It's not an easy season. Yeah. So that's usually like a month of shots and that's, it was every other day going into the, our, our IVF doctors in Carmel. So driving to Carmel every other day to just make sure that my uterine lining was like thickening. So they'd all stick. And then at a certain point, they have to be a like when they hit this size, it's like it's happening then. Like mm. there is no. Uh, so then there's a time sensitive, what they call a trigger shot that 
kind of forces her body it's into ovulation. Yeah. Um, what well, kind of starts when you describe it that way with all those trips to the doctor, like it really is like, oh, no wonder it costs so much money. Yes. Well, yeah. And the to- honestly, like the 26,000 number I threw out earlier doesn't even include the gas and mileage on our yeah, car. Yeah, right. Um, that's the medicine mm. is a big part of it. So the shots are f- the, that we buy for a cycle are five to eight thousand dollars or so and then once you get into transfers you're spending additional thousands of dollars on the medicine itself yeah um mm. so the egg retrieval happens that's crazy and then it's so they well they put me under yeah right so they go in they like suck up all the eggs that had reached a certain amount of size i think it's maybe 10 millimeters or something um, yeah i can't remember they always measure it on the screen i've had a lot of ultrasounds yeah um, yeah Ultrasounds, blood test <clears throat> shots, yeah. and doctor's appointments. Yep. Um, and while I'm under, he's in the bathroom jagging off. <laughs> Just having himself a great right. time. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's not fun, believe me. <laughs> um, um, but yeah, so like it ha- they want, because they want like a fresh sperm sample yeah. in that moment to then go into a, a lab mm. and... Put everything in a petri dish and. What's the time frame? Do you remember? Is it two days? It's three days. For um, how many embryos you know you get? Yep. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yep. Yeah. So they tried it. So if you do a, f- so that's the other confusing thing is like there's a fresh embryo transfer, and then there's a frozen embryo transfer, and the fresh has to be done within three to five days of the embryos being created. And your um, hormones have to be at a certain level, which yeah. means more blood draws and. and And then frozen is they cryogenically freeze your embryos until you're ready to then do a transfer, which for us, frozen transfer is the way we've had to go all but once. Mm. Um, And that then comes with more shots, more money, more waiting, (laughs) more doctor's appointments. Um, And I mean, like it got to the point where we had given Ronnie so many shots, um, like it was hard for her to get, you know, get comfortable in bed she was black mm. and blue Man. on the front like front of her stomach and on her hips there, like it was there are times that i could only wear leggings because like jeans or anything with a waist like really hurt just killed you yeah wow. and then you throw in like the you know you want to exercise because aerobic exercise is good for your body especially when you're trying to conceive but you're so painful, like in so much pain. Yeah. You walk that then and anything that... <laughs> jiggles and it's like. So yeah. it, it just is a, Man. I mean, it's really hard to watch your partner go through that, especially when they're doing it. It's a choice and it's a choice for your family. Right. But at the same time, like she didn't have to make that choice she chose that. And so like the fact that she's, you know, talk about sacrificial love, yeah. right. Willing to put her body through that in order to try to conceive is, is a pretty, um, humbling thing, but also just like, it's hard to watch. Yeah. Um, and so then, you know, the I- embryo transfers come along, there's shots before that. Yep. Um, I would say in all, you've probably had 400 shots at this point. Mm. Yeah. Over a well, maybe more, but over about a eighteen month to two year journey of yeah. true IVF processing. So, so are there other medicines you have to take, like pills and different things like that? There are suppositories, okay. um, female suppositories, and then there are also literally um, didn't know that was a thing. Yeah, didn't we? Didn't either, that and that was an awkward like, how are we supposed to do this? Like, what does that look like? Um, hmm. So it was an interesting conversation with a doctor yeah. there are some oral medications and it all depends on what your body does like low cycle thyroid mm. levels hormone levels like so at any time they could decide hey you know that your levels are looking like this we're actually going to stop we're going to like yes. scale back yes. the shots or yes. we're going to scale back we're or we're going to increase okay. the shots yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. and then from one transfer to the next like so we had eight Seven and frozen embryos the first time. Seven. Seven and then. And then eight this last time. Yeah, mm-hmm. and so like, from transfer one to transfer two, they may change the protocol. And so like yeah. last time you may have been on shots and baby aspirin, and uh, prenatal, and this time you're on estrogen and a prenatal and beef liver for your thyroid wow. and all these other things. And then to complicate matters even more. There's different schools of thought, 
And so, like, we were, Ronnie went to see a, um, an acupuncturist, and the acupuncturist was like, hey, you should try beef liver supplements like it's supposed to help. Well, we did, and we put her on it, and then we went to the doctor, and her thyroid, like, had spiked to where it looked like she had, like, hypothyroidism or whatever, and we that had never been an issue. And I actually was, like, started Googling on my phone because I'm like, what has changed since last mm-hmm. time? Because this was, what, four transfers, five transfers in. Like, we'd been through this quite a few times. Yeah. And I saw that beef liver can do that. So I said something to the nurse, and she was like, oh, we didn't – like, we knew you were on it, but we hadn't thought about the interaction from that perspective. And so then they were like, stop the beef liver immediately. Mm-hmm. So yeah. it's just – it's it's a, it's it's a, a science project. Yeah. yeah. Well, and – you know, there because everyone's body is so different. There are some medicines you have to combine yourself. Um, oh yeah. Because there is so much, uh, y- you it's know. Just time sensitive and. Well, I'm talking about your, no, your five vials. So, like, based on what my body needed, like Brad was, he compared himself to Breaking Bad. Like every morning he I was, was in Walter our. Walter White. Yeah. yeah. So he was in the he was in our kitchen like mixing up my shot and. Like putting a uh, saline solution into powdered medication, shaking it up in vials, drawing it, removing it. Like it, I, I, you really start to feel like you're a doctor. <laughs> Eating up the spoon. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah uh, and so it just, I mean, I'm sure Ronnie felt like a guinea pig or, a, you know, like getting poked and prodded. I felt like I was learning how to become a mad scientist. Like mm. it's, it's kind of a wild ride to be on um and i mean there have been times that we because shots are very some some you can take like within a general window of time and some are like you have to take it at this time yeah so i mean there have been horrible places that we've been in that we've had to do a shot but it's like we're there i was announcing for basketball games and Mm. we went to the parking lot and like yeah We've done shots in parking lots at schools, in church offices, and other people's like homes or bedrooms, um, in a grass field outside the Indiana State Fair, like because it was so time sensitive. Yeah, we had and to you never step know what's away. Going on around you, you know? yeah. yeah, I mean it's Shoot. and it, that was it, it's just. It's also awkward because you have to stop whatever's happening. Yeah, like we would have people over for a game night and be like, "Hey, you need to give us twenty minutes." Because we have to go do a shot, um, and not like the fun, you know, like shot, shot, shots. It's a so it takes, so it takes like, like twenty minutes. It's well, it because you gotta ice think, it. Yeah, you okay. gotta alcohol swab it, like mix all it's the medicine. The yeah, it's not, and then it's she needs not to. just like because I'm thinking like a. It's not like a flu shot. It's not like a little EpiPen thing. It's not like a little EpiPen sends you to the hospital. Well, I'm sorry. I, mean, I, <laughs> I know what you mean. It's not like it's not the easy. Yeah, not diabetic. Like okay. And and yeah. some of that was yeah, like that, that's, that's some of it is of. Ronnie's body. Like we figured out that hey, if if we ice the the part of the body that the shot has to go into, she handles the pain of the shot better, mm. right? Um, but there it was like so you got to do that. But then you also have to alcohol swab. But then you got to let the alcohol swab dry so that it yeah. doesn't sting because right. you're getting alcohol into the pinprick. Yep. I mean, we and got so to it, be it, it yeah. became like the me- we had it down to a T. Yeah. It was crazy. And then a lot of times she just needed to rest afterwards yeah. before she went and interacted with somebody again. Yeah. yeah. So is that kind of all the process? Kind of everything that you've had to do for so, IVF? Um, I just the, don't want to miss anything. Yeah, so after so after they have all the embryos, they schedule a transfer. Mm-hmm. And then the there is the the 10 days mm-hmm. after transfer when you come in to get a pregnancy test. Okay. And those are the worst 10 days ever because Yeah, the waiting is awful. You it's like yeah. it's like the hardest balance cuz like Brad had mentioned before, you want to be active. Yep. Um like cuz that's good for you, but at the same time like you're not supposed to do any heavy lifting or like hard exercise, and so you're like, okay, so I can't, I can't, I need to work out, but I'm not supposed to do things like that are hard. Then, uh, it's you, also like a I season can't. of looking for answers, right? So like, yeah. I don't know how many times we went through this, and we'd wake up in the morning, and Ronnie would like turn around and be like, I'm spotting, you know, or, or do my breasts look bigger? And of course, I'm like. 
Every morning, let's check. Let me see. Let's, <laughs> let me, let me, come here. All right. Hold on, hold on. <laughs> let me see again. Yeah. I don't know. Let me see in this other light, right? Like, um, but I mean, that was like, we were hoping because the, yeah. the signs of pregnancy, like we're dying to find. But I don't know yeah. if you've ever looked at signs. Like, I don't know if you and Bri are like, is this right? Like, if you've ever waited to know, but like. All of the signs for yes, you are pregnant or no, you're not pregnant are the same. They're like exactly <laughs> the same. So if you're spotting, you could be starting your period, but you also could be pregnant. And yeah. if it's like pink or brown, it could be like you're pregnant and it's getting rid of old blood. But it also could be that it's getting rid of old blood because you're starting. Or your if period. you're bloated, or, it could be that you're getting ready to start your period. I mean, like, or it's well, that you're yeah, yeah you know, you got pregnancy. Was, uh, so. Yeah. I don't think ours I don't think ours has ever been dur- it's been more of the scary like hey you're several months pregnant like you know that you're pregnant and, mm. and suddenly something like that happens yeah. and you're kind of like should you go to the hospital should you, you know that yeah. that yeah. kind of stuff. Yeah. Um and then we I don't know. We had trouble having our second kid and that was during COVID I think so that was it's not the same as your your situation but it, right. you know it was still kind of like um it can turn, I don't know, it can turn sex into a chore. It can turn, I mean, there's that whole side of it. It can, like, what are what are we doing wrong? Again, you know, all the, all the yeah. stuff you talked about. Yeah. Is it me? Is it you? Is it, you know, all that stuff. And um, I think the, the most painful part of all of that just for us was, like, it, it feels like this isn't something you want to be doing. Yeah. It You know, it turns this into a chore or something, and that's kind of, that sucks because you feel kind of used and you can, you know, and it's like, that wasn't anything she did or I did that, that I don't, you know, purposefully, but yeah. it was kind of like, wow, we've uh, never done this this much, you know, and this many nights in a row and this, you know, yep. and yep. I know that we wouldn't be if we weren't trying to have a baby. And so yeah. it's kind of like, okay. You start to drive yourself nuts a little bit. Yeah. You know, like ovulation tracking and all yeah. of those things when you're, right. when you're just trying naturally, Right. And then, so then you take that piece of like the waiting and wondering and hoping Mm -hmm. and you combine it with the fact that they literally are going to like, you get a 10 day window and they're going to tell you. Yeah. Right. And, and it's, it's just one of those. And for us personally, a lot of times the 10 day window was going to end on a Monday or a Tuesday. Um, and usually Saturday or Sunday, like we pretty well knew one way or the other, right? And there was, they tell you not to take a pregnancy test. We did, obviously. Uh, everybody, would, I think everybody that goes through fertility probably does. Yeah, how can you not? Yeah. Um, and that that is a blessing and a curse because the one, like, so we did have a miscarriage. Um, the time that we did get pregnant, we, we got to know for a few days before she had the miscarriage. Mm. And so we did get a semblance of the excitement and yeah. the, the relief, um, which I, in, in retrospect, am thankful that we got to experience that brief bit of joy yeah. because we chose to take a pregnancy test. Yeah. Um, but then, you know, you go through immense pain after that. So yeah. it's, right. it's, this, it's just a roller coaster. Like IVF is so exhausting. So this shirt, actually, uh, I wore to every single uh, transfer because Mm. this is my lucky shirt, although it didn't end up being lucky. Um, But I I was terrified of sharks, like kind of like terrified of shots. But like Mm. um, I could not get into the ocean. And I lived in Florida for a couple of years. Okay. Um, And uh, so I decided like, you know, I'm not living life in fear. Like I'm going to face this head on. And so there have been multiple times now that I've, like pay to swim with sharks, like be in a shark tank. Um, and so that was the first time I did this. And so it's was like, I can do brave things. Like mm-hmm. I can, I can face these things. I like that. Um, and so every time I, I went, um, like I, I wore my shirt mm. and Brad, we, we have matching pineapple socks too. Cause that. Yeah. yeah. Well, and, and you know, on the topic of like, I can do brave things on the way here, Ronnie started talking about how she wanted to donate blood Mm. which years ago she would have never considered, but she was like learning how to deal with shots and like needles should have some good come from it. And if that good is that I can now provide blood to somebody that needs it, like again, trying to find those things that are blessings in the skies, right? Like God can use our misery for good. And this is one of those things. Right. And so like she has realized I can do brave things. Like I can donate blood. That's something that I can 
be a part of and yeah. give into the world. Yeah. Which really, you know, I, I don't want to cut off anything if you had anything else on IVF. I mean, so you guys have essentially moved on from IVF. You've decided, hey, because, you know, you like the black and white answers. You like the yes and no. Hey, if it's not going to work, just tell me and I'll move on right to the next option. Um, so in terms of doing brave things, yeah. kind of what's next? What does that look like for you guys? Well, just to rewind just a little bit. Sure. Um, so we had our fifth transfer mm. um, in March. Yep. Um, and that was after. So we, we had a phone call with our doctor. Um, in just, May. No, no, no. I'm, I'm talking before. Oh, sorry. Yep. Um, just to say, like, what what can we do? Like, why is this not working? Is there something that we can be changing? Yeah. And his comment, uh, or one of the questions I asked was, is it school? Is it stress? Um, right. You, you were a teacher. Yep. Uh, Middle taught, school. Yep. Seventh grade English. And, um, and I, Brad can attest to this, but I was just not very good at, at clocking out. Um, like, mm. I brought a lot of stress home and never stopped. Um, and so um, just kind of asked, like, you know, that's the only thing I could think of that's keeping, you know, like I've ha I've now had a laparoscopy. I've mm -hmm. now like had a lot of things, um, looked at me, yeah. um, because all in all, everything was supposed to work. Like, like we found out that Brad had like, like had some sperm mo mobility issues. Um, but that was not supposed to be a problem once we did IVF, like, mm -hmm. and everything mm -hmm. in their words had been like, my right. body looks great. Sure. And so, um, it's and in, in their words, they're like everything has been perfect. Like they mm. did a laparoscopy, everything looks perfect. Like yeah. our embryos look perfect. And um, so anyway, uh, if it's all perfect, why is it not working? Yeah. And so, you know, his comment to us was that uh, infertility can cause stress, but stress can also cause infertility. And so we made the decision to uh, to to for me to quit teaching. Mm -hmm. um, and so. At the end of December last year, I, I walked away, um, and uh, March came around. And it was like we put all of our chips on the table. Like there's, we'd made every change, we'd done everything, and uh, it still ended up not working. Mm -hmm. um, and so in May, we we just had a phone call with our doctor, and he's like, "I've looked at your chart, I've poured over it, and I I can't make a single change." Like like you can't come up with an answer for why, and so. I, Ronnie, to her credit, was finally like, I just need you to tell us, like, should we stop pursuing this? Yeah. And he was like, I am always hesitant to tell people to stop give, having hope or, yeah. like, trying, but I don't see why continuing to throw money at this. Like, if because we know that you've already considered other options for becoming parents, like, I wouldn't, I wouldn't keep throwing money at this option. Like, yeah. you guys need to move on. So. And you and you've mentioned before too. You kind of had some a little help from family yeah. fundraising to do that. I mean, it's a lot of money, yeah. um, even for people who have decent jobs. It's a lot of money to yeah. throw to throw at something like that um, that doesn't end up working. And so you know you you'd mentioned just kind of that feeling of letting people down. Yeah, like yeah. That, that's heavy, man. Yeah. That is so heavy. And again, not that anybody would ever make you feel that way. Hopefully, God, but it's just another heavy part of it yeah. to deal with. And we have four four embryos left um, okay. that are frozen. Um, but but yeah, we started like so. The doctor said, "Hey, you know, this is this is probably not worth your while right now." You know, he and and to his credit, he said, "If you if at some point you want to think about what to do with those embryos, like there are options. Like mm -hmm. surrogacy is an option. We've been talking and kind of praying through that. What's that look like?" Um, you know, we have to find somebody that we know that's willing to do that because to get a stranger to do it, it's like a hundred thousand dollars. Like it's super expensive. Um, but it was so crazy because I was a hundred percent against fostering and not because I don't think foster care is a beautiful thing because I was so worried about the pain of yeah. loving a child and then having them taken away from us to be reunited yeah. with a family member. And we know a lot of people that have fostered, and we've seen the success. We've also seen horror stories. Yeah. Um, 
same thing happens with adoption. Like we know a couple that multiple times has been in route to go get a child and then been told, just kidding, (laughs) turn around and go home. Um, But it was crazy the way God worked over the last several months. And like our church has been really promoting like family and foster care and adoption programs. But like, Mm. I feel like this year in particular, maybe it's because of where we're at that I've noticed it more. I feel like foster care has been in our faces at every turn in a really good way. Um, and so my heart started to really soften and we have some, some really good friends that, um, adopted a child that they had fostered and to see the growth in him from being a, a little boy laying on the floor that they said, like, you know, he can't barely can lift his head. He can't feed himself to running up to me at church and letting me pick him up and like asking me questions. And, you know, it's just like those things have really pushed us in a direction Mm. where, um, we feel like foster care is where God's calling us to. And, and there was a sermon, go ahead. Well, I was, so I was going to say there was a sermon that, um, you know, the, the question came out of like, if Jesus came back tomorrow, like what, what have you done? Right. Like, or, or what, what was, uh, what is the thing that you would have regretted not doing? Mm. Um, and, and Ronnie took that to heart very much to be like, there are a lot of kids on earth today that will never know Jesus. Yeah. Um, because there's not a family member that's teaching them or they're in, uh, you know, a bad situation at home we have the opportunity to be those people that come alongside those kids in foster care and teach them about Jesus. Right. Well, I think, I, I don't know, for me personally, I can't speak for everybody, but there, there have definitely been a lot of sermons where I felt convicted because they're like, well, are you living like Jesus is coming tomorrow? And I'm like, well, okay, I would love for Jesus to come tomorrow, but like, I also really want to get married first, or I also really want to have a kid first. Or I'm, I was joking with my family, but I, I like as a high school very sheltered kid, I was like, I need Jesus to wait so I can have sex. I yeah. want to know what that feels like. Yeah. Um, and so it's like I, I <laughs> say she lucked out. <laughs> <laughs> my man. <laughs> um, there are all these things I wanted to wait, like I wanted Jesus yeah. to wait so that I could have that. But you know what? Like tomorrow's never promised, and if I if we never get kids, like I don't want to. I mean, I was a teacher. I know a lot of kids go home to really hard families. Mm-hmm. And, like, if we can do something, mm. you know, like, we, we should be. Like, we, God has very deeply impressed on our hearts that we, I mean, a love for kids. Like, that is yeah. something we are very passionate about, and we want to see kids' lives changed by Jesus. Yeah. Um, and so if we can't have our own kids and grow them up in faith, like, why are we not helping all the other kids that are already here? Well, I've heard some crazy stats. I don't know what's true and what's not, but just, like if if every church in America mm-hmm. have you have you probably heard it yeah, adopted heard one child from the foster care system, it would eradicate, we'd eradicate the foster, foster care kids. basically. Yeah, yeah. The need no, for it. yeah. I I don't know that every single church is equipped to help the people who are going to adopt or foster. I mean, there's very expensive yeah. <laughs> stuff that still has to happen with that, right? I mean. Um, the idea is awesome, uh, but in practice, it's like, I mean, the average church is like 80 people in the country. We think like your church, you know, I don't know, 1,400 people, something yeah, like probably, 1,500, yeah. I don't know. Um, you know, my church, I don't know, probably 700 people, I don't know. Uh, but it's like, that's not most churches, and, you know, would most churches have the resources to support people? And then at the same time, you can't, there's a certain type of support that you literally just can't provide yeah. to people that foster, or you can't provide enough emotional support for people whose adopted kids are just nuts and have disabilities or, you know, mental, you know, things wrong with their mental capacities and emotional um, issues that they just literally like will never get over. Yeah. Um, you can't really do anything about that. So there's a level of financial support. I think that that speaks to, but not always everything else that's involved. So that's something you guys have probably thought through. I'm sure it's like, hey, we've watched our friends have these like great success stories, but also like really challenging foster yeah. Yeah. moments. And you've touched on that, like, hey, you get a kid and then you start to love them. You start to see a future with them and potentially out of nowhere, they go home. Yeah. 
well, and I've seen students on, on the same, mm. like we, we helped a couple students last year, two years ago. A couple years um, ago, yeah. yeah. Because they had been placed in foster care, but mm. then like bounced back and forth between parents that were continually yeah. using. It's like they didn't change. And yeah. It's so funny. yeah, and there's, it's, uh, again, part of it is, you know, uh, you hear this a lot, like, you don't realize how many Jeeps are on the road until you go buy yourself a Jeep, right? True story, yeah. um, it's, it's just kind of one of those, like, until you're looking for it, you don't see it all the time. Right. But I'm blown away with what seems to be a huge uptick in the number of um, organizations that are trying to help foster care families. So we got to go to a casino night with some of my best friends, um, that was specifically around fundraising for an organization that makes sure that foster families have cribs and strollers mm. and clothes and diapers and all nice. of the things yeah. they need at a moment's notice, right? Yeah. Like they get a call, you're getting a baby tonight. We need these things yeah. immediately. Um, is that so here in town? What, what th- is that, that one is based out of Greenwood. Franklin or mm-hmm. Greenwood, um, somewhere in Johnson County. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Um, and and there's there's organizations like that in Columbus as well. Um, and, and it's just becoming more prevalent. And so like one of the things I think that is important is people partnering with those organizations coming alongside them. Yeah. I think the other thing that I, um, you know, would, would encourage people is like when you get ready to throw away those baby items or donate them to Goodwill, like ask your church if there's a foster family that could benefit from those things. That's good. Yeah. Um, we know that there's a lot of families around us that have small children right now so that when we get placed with a foster kid in the future, hopefully we can say, Hey, like Chris and Bria, we really need X, Y, and Z. Do you have any of these items that we could buy off of you or borrow from you? Right? Like, um, and not everybody has that, but we, we very much feel like we're in a community where our church is pretty large, we've got a huge group of friends and family yeah. that are going to support us and come alongside us and love these kids as well as they love us. Mm-hmm. And so that's kind of been like a light switch event for us yeah. to, to make a jump to focusing to the point that we sold our house and moved to Columbus and you know have made some pretty drastic, big life changes to yep. prepare to become foster parents. Wow, yeah. Is there a certain organization that you go through to do that, or they, like? Well, so I don't know what that process even looks like. Because I mean, I, I've I've seen the adoption process pretty mm-hmm. closely through uh, my brother and sister in law, and you know they headed down that journey of adopting overseas, tens of thousands of dollars. Yeah. They yeah. didn't end up getting to have a child, um, and it was I, I don't know, ironically because they had tattoos, the country they were trying to get, you know. A child from, they said, hey, by the way, this isn't going to work out. Uh, there was another country. This was the second country. First one fell through. Second one, they said, uh, the judge, a judge will never let you have a kid from this country because you look the way that you do with tattoos all over your mm-hmm. arms and legs and neck and everywhere. Um, so I've seen the painful part of that, uh, but I don't really know what fostering looks like at all. So what we've been told and and like i said uh, this isn't we're making steps right now to prepare ourselves and one of those steps is to meet with several foster families to get okay. more knowledge and experience yeah. but from what we've heard um dcs is the way to get babies um, really which is where we want to start right like we want I, that's people are going to laugh at this on the podcast but like we want the sleepless nights i want to be spit up on like i want to experience all of the really hard annoying things about being a dad (laughs) even if we can't like even if we foster to adopt and the kid we adopt is not a baby like we we kind of want to fill in those stages even if they're with different kids because we won't get a full like life shot style most likely yeah yeah but so dcs is the best way to get a baby um there are other like non-profit organizations that do foster care like uh, Bethany Christian Services. Mm. Um, there's a couple others that are, are I'm blanking at the moment, but DCS is is kind of the most direct route. Um, it also comes with the most challenges. Yeah. Well, I've kind of heard that if you get a baby, it's because the baby or the parents were on drugs. Yeah, basically. So that's yeah. yeah. I mean, like ninety percent of 
like birth mothers that with kids in the foster care system as babies are drug addicted. Mm -hmm. Like that's pretty common. So um, we plan to move forward with DCS. I feel like that's kind of where God has called us. It's about a four month licensure program. So they do four home visits in four months. Mm. Um, you do have to pay for that. There's, uh, it's not a huge fee, but it's like a thousand dollars, fifteen hundred dollars, somewhere in there. Um, to so get that's kind of similar to adoption. Yeah, they similar to a home, home study. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, and that's good for several years, correct? Yeah, I mean yeah, it's okay. good for licensure for you know once you get licensed, you have to get you have to keep your license updated. I think it's similar to having like a, a teacher's license, like. Okay continuing education and participating in things. Um, but it's, it's good for a while. And then, um, from there really it's as soon as your license, like you could get your licensure, you know, today and you could get a call tomorrow. Mm. Um, wow. it doesn't always happen that fast, but it could. Yeah. And so we wanted to position ourselves where we were in a place that we could accept siblings or multiple kids if, if necessary. Um, and be prepared to like take on whatever God has in store for us. You just could come at you real quick. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. Lord willing. Yeah. Lord willing, it yeah. does. I guess. Yeah. But like I said earlier, like why not us? Yeah. You know, we we are surrounded by family who will love our kids really well, and we have multiple friends that will care for our kids. As yeah. Well. Yeah. Well. Ronnie keeps our kids and does a fantastic job. Uh, <laughs> Thursdays, Fridays, and sometimes a Wednesday or something. Um, and yeah, watching you, I think interact with our kids is awesome. And uh, I just yeah, I pray so so much that you guys get to experience the joys of of just kids. Period. You know, whether it's yeah. um, Thank you. through some kind of uh, accident or some you know adoption or fostering i mean i just i can't wait to see your house full of kids you got a nice big new house and big old pool and uh it would just be such a blessing to see it yeah. just full of life and kids and i know those grandparents want some mm-hmm. you know those parents want They're some right. grandbabies right. right. they are right. yeah, yeah. <laughs> well yeah. um i don't know if i missed anything on your list um ronnie had a few things that she wanted to talk through um i would really love to know uh, if you could just kind of encourage someone who's going through a similar journey or they're just trying to figure out which path to take, obviously there are a lot of intangibles that you don't know about, um, whether it's a, you know, a lifestyle or finances or just um, a season that, that they can't have, one option is not open to somebody. Um, but, you know, Ronnie, we'll start with you. You know, if you could like encourage someone listening um, who's just going through a fertility journey and just, just struggling and just doesn't, doesn't know what to do to keep going or, you know, how to process everything that's happening. I mean, what would your encouragement be? Well, um, I think the big thing would just be that you're not less of a woman for not being a mom. Um, and that like, even though it doesn't feel okay now, it it can be okay later. Um, Mm. that doesn't make you any less, um, that you are still loved and lovable. Um, that there way more there's way more to you than than just being able to conceive that's good that's good yeah i appreciate that what about you yeah i would say for men um going back to transparency breeds transparency right if you're struggling don't do it alone uh talk to somebody um i mean that goes for men and women but talk to somebody because you'll be shocked at how many people um are on a similar path Yep. And, uh, you know, if that means you watch Chris's podcast and reach out to me on Facebook or Instagram, like, that's fine. Like, let's get coffee. Let's hang out because I don't want to see anybody feel like they have to walk this path alone. Yeah. And it's kind of you guys to share your pain. I mean, I know it's even painful to do that. It's, it's tough to just rehash, you know, all of these terrible moments that you've had and uh but i i'm just really grateful too that you share the good moments and and the moments that make you feel like god is making you uh more like him and you know praise god for that and uh, i pray for more of that honestly like kids or no kids like that's just for your marriage and and for your family i I just hope that you guys become more and more like jesus and uh, a lot of times it just takes the harder things to 
to make that happen. So thank you for the examples that you are uh, to a lot of other people that you just, I'm telling you, I, I said it earlier, I can't even stress how many people I've had these types of conversations with. Mm-hmm. Again, some have kids already, some don't, but it's still, it's still a struggle. It's still something that people are dealing with that, yep. that they don't talk about. And so thank you guys for talking about it. And if you want to read more about uh, their journey, uh, remind me what the website is again, the blog. Party of Two Waiting, and that two is in the number two. Yep. Okay. You and can then, also visit our Etsy store. Your Etsy store. That's right. Okay. Party of right. Two. Got some fun IVF shirts on there. Okay. All right. Yeah, we'll definitely link to that uh, down below in the description, in the comments. And uh, I hope that you visit that. I hope you've been really encouraged by uh, their journey. And uh, I'm sure I will uh, split this up into smaller clips. But Brad and Ronnie also actually said that they would be willing to answer any questions in the comments. So um, if you are not following, you know, if you see this on Facebook, Instagram, uh, anything like that, go follow Church with Chris on YouTube. And uh, anywhere they can find the comments, I will probably send them your way. And people can, you know, whether it's DMs or comments, you know, in comment sections that are, are public, um, they said they would answer any questions that you guys have, you know, and you got time, you're, you're willing to get with people yeah, um, to, to just share in the journey uh, if you're local. And if you're not local, hey, reach out, reach out. And uh, I hope there's a blessing to you. I hope you guys um, maybe can move forward one more day in faith and in hope and uh, that life is going to improve. And, you know, even when things don't turn out the way that we want them to, I hope that you continue to fall more and more in love with Jesus mm-hmm. and uh, to follow whatever plans he does have for your life. And so, Brad and Ronnie, thank you so much. Next time you guys are on, I hope it is that we are celebrating uh, the next journey that you guys have in life. Yeah. Thanks, thank Chris. You. All right.